Definitely the best and easiest degree I've ever gotten. <laughs> Good morning and congratulations, class of 2017. Thank you, graduates. Thank you, President Chaplain, for that incredibly warm introduction and for inviting me to help celebrate this magical day. Faculty, parents, friends, invited guests, uninvited guests, <laughs> it is a true honor to be here with you all. What President Chaplain didn't tell you and what you may not be able to see thanks to this black slimming gown, which I've repurposed as a fashion-forward maternity dress, is that your graduation speaker this year is eight and a half months pregnant. How enlightened and brave and daring of Prez Chap is that? Enlightened and daring, or really, really desperate. <laughs> but don't worry, my husband Colin and I have told our baby girl that she is not to arrive early, and as I understand it, children always do what their parents tell them. <laughs> but just in case she proves to be defiant and decides to surprise us, according to Google Maps, we can get to Frederick Memorial in four minutes. <laughs> And obviously, Google Maps is never wrong, right? <laughs> Pregnant or not, nothing could keep me from being here to celebrate this special day with you. Let me congratulate your parents and grandparents and relatives, the ones who watched you take your first steps and first breaths on this earth, and today get to watch you walk across this sacred stage and take their breath away. Congratulations to the big sisters and big brothers who always believed in you and the little sisters and little brothers who were shocked you made it out of high school. <laughs> Congratulations to the friends and teachers and loved ones who have sweetened every success and lent a shoulder for every setback. I especially have to thank Hood College for conferring upon me an honorary degree, officially making me a doctor today. Although I have three advanced degrees, have served two first ladies, and am about to give the gift of life, I suspect only now will my 79-year-old South Asian mother finally be proud of me. <laughs> Graduates, we assemble today to honor your achievements, the extraordinary spellbinding journey of the class of 2017. Congratulations. College days have been marked by defining moments for America. In technology, from the arrival of autonomous robots to private shuttles to space. In sports, from the Cubs winning the World Series after a century, to Maryland by itself bringing home more gold medals than all but five countries. In pop culture, from the meteoric rise of Hamilton to the groundbreaking drop of Lemonade. In history, from the truly global climate treaty to the Supreme Court recognizing marriage equality as the law of our land. And in politics, from the second term of the first black president to the election of the first orange one. an extraordinary four years. And while all of that unfolded around you, you were hard at work. From donning dinks on your first day here at Hood, to papers and exams that contributed to countless all-nighters, to friends and teachers that ignited your imagination and intellect, you have at last arrived on this day of ritual to collect your reward. And you deserve it more than most. Many of you have taken out loans and worked your way through school. You have juggled responsibilities publicly, but struggled privately, confiding only to family and friends how hard this has been sometimes. You have no doubt doubted yourselves and been tempted to quit. 
But just as your parents raised you and following the proud tradition of this school and our nation, you never did, which is why we gather here to congratulate you. But I'm also here to deliver a call to action on behalf of a generation that desperately needs you. Today, I want to talk with you about the historic progress and modern plight of women in this country, about the journey that remains from citizenship to leadership, from having a seat at the table to being at the head of it. I'll be honest, a few years ago, even a few months ago, I would have hesitated to take on a topic that risks defining me by only one of the many things that defines me. But even that is one of those hesitations that men have never had. I have had the privilege of working for two of the most amazing women in the world, Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton. And I was raised by another one, my mother. If my mother... If my mother and mentors taught me anything, it is that it is well past time for us to follow Sheryl Sandberg's directive to lean in. So here we go. For the first time in American history, we are at risk of bequeathing to the next generation a country worse than we found it, more divided here at home and less secure around the globe. Our parents and grandparents and their parents and their grandparents left us a better world than the one they inherited. And they had to face down a civil war, a Great Depression, the rise of the most poisonous ideologies the world has ever seen, and the threat of nuclear war. So let's try to keep it in perspective the next time we're at Starbucks and the line's too long. <laughs> or when our tweets don't get as many followers as we think they should. Of course, that's coming from someone who's tweeted 18 times to 88 followers. If I break 100 thanks to this speech, I'm breaking out the champagne. Well, okay, for now, sparkling cider. Each time, those generations vanquish true mortal threats to the nation and never relinquish their sacred duty as stewards of humanity, mindful of the generations to come. Long before the First Lady put it so perfectly, our forebearers embodied what she meant when she said, when they go low, we go high. Now I should make an important clarification because of something I overheard while walking through the pergola. The first lady said, when they go low, we go high. Not, when they go low, we get high. <laughs> so parents, do not let them quote the first lady for that. I'll admit, the first time the First Lady said this in a private meeting to me, I also misunderstood it. My initial reaction was, oh great, here's another short joke. Michelle Obama lording over me the fact that she's a foot taller. Now, I realize that that sounds a little bit sensitive, but you've got to understand, in my very first meeting with the First Lady, she teased me incessantly about my height and joked how the White House needed to institute minimum height requirements like they have at roller coasters. <laughs> Thanks to the generations of Americans who have taken the high road, with regard to the advancement of women, there is real progress to report. And Hood College has been leading the charge. When Mrs. Obama created Let Girls Learn, what she imagined is what you have had here at Co Hood College for a century an institution of exceptional learning chartered in 1893 for, quote, the promotion and advancement of women. Women remain underrepresented across the country in science and math, but here at Hood, with one exception, every one of your mathematics professors are women. female MBA candidate who will graduate from Hood this afternoon helped manufacture a cancer-fighting drug that helped President Jimmy Carter fight off metastatic brain cancer. Yeah. Yeah. We lament that we have never had a woman as president. Well, Hood College has had three. And your student government elects women all the time. None of them are tweeting out insanity in all caps at 3 a.m. <laughs> 
what I have found uplifting in my conversations about this subject with the graduating men of Hood College is how much they share the same values and commitments. The young men I spoke with already understood what it has taken centuries for the rest of us to figure out. That unleashing the promise of women advances the interests of us all. To the men in the audience, this movement is about the mothers who brought you into this world. The daughters you will one day bring into the world. The women who are or will become your partners and best friends in everything you do. And I don't say this simply because the fate of women impacts the future of men, but because we need your help. Achieving true equality may be the one thing women cannot do alone. In fact, this past January, we all marched shoulder to shoulder with our mothers and sisters and daughters, but also hand in hand with our fathers and brothers and sons, together standing up for the values that unite and define us. And we are seeing encouraging signs of progress, not just at Hood College, but across the country. For the first time, women equal or outnumber men in colleges and universities, graduate schools, law schools, med schools. More women than men will earn master's and doctorate degrees. And that's not even counting the one that I just got. <laughs> we also have more female US senators than ever before. Three justices on the Supreme Court, millions of cracks in that highest, hardest glass ceiling, and the first woman in history to win the popular vote for President of the United States. We live in a country where women have made strides towards equality that just a few short years ago would have seemed unattainable, and a few generations ago would have been unthinkable. There's certainly progress to celebrate, but our arc is incomplete. Women have ascended from property and slavery to subordinate spouses and second-class citizens. Now we must make the leap from citizenship to leadership. We have won for ourselves in principle and on paper the right to speak, the right to vote, the right to shape the destiny of our bodies and our families. Now we must secure the right to shape the destiny of our communities and our country. To echo an idea civil rights leader Julian Bond once shared in the context of race, our progress should not become the death of the movement. Let it not be said that the fiercest obstacle to achieving equality for women was the temptation to think we already had. For virtually every stride forward, there has been a reversal, a regression, a retreat. So when a 36-year-old commencement speaker says equal pay for equal work is the exception, or that women's opportunities to advance at upper levels of management are rare enough to be displayed in a museum, it seems like she would be telling you something that you already know. The thing is, that speaker isn't me, although I take the compliment that I could perhaps pass for 36. <laughs> that was actually Gloria Steinem delivering the commencement address at Vassar nearly 50 years ago in 1970. Yet today, women are still only paid 83 cents to the dollar. If that stays the same, the men graduating today will earn a million dollars more over their careers than the women sitting next to them. Unfortunately, the higher up the ladder you get, the worse it gets. Women have led IBM and Pepsi and GM, but those are the exceptions. The reality is that less than 5% of Fortune 500 companies today are led by women. Women have quietly endured these everyday inequities and many others for long enough. From not being called on in math class when you know you know the answer to being groped by a stranger on a crowded bus. These daily indignities produce wounds that never heal. We see those wounds in the empty chairs on exam day when not a single woman takes the AP computer science exam in Montana or Mississippi. We see them in the culture of silence and shame that shrouds too many of our college campuses, where one in three women are sexually assaulted or raped during college, while at the same time, 89% of those schools report not a single complaint. We see the broader impact here at home in Maryland, where no woman currently holds elected 
federal or statewide office. All eight members of Congress, both senators, the attorney general, the comptroller, the lieutenant governor, and the governor are all men. That means those 14 offices have the same number of women today as they did 100 years ago, when women didn't have the option of voting, or two centuries ago, when women could not own property separate from their husbands. Pennsylvania to the north is just as bad with no women. West Virginia and Virginia to the south are faring nominally better, with one female elected official each. For those of you keeping score, out of 66 federal and statewide elected positions in this region representing more than 15 million women, only two, yes, two, are held by women. None of those four states have ever elected a female governor. In Congress over the past quarter century, women have gained only about three seats every two years in the House of Representatives. At this pace, women won't catch up to men until 2100, when everyone here, except your little brothers and sisters, will be over 100 years old. Graduates, I wish for every one of you to live to 100, but not for the sake of, of waiting for a future that should already have arrived. I began this morning with a reference to my timeless, inspiring mother. She was likely born a century before she was supposed to, but declined to wait for the future to arrive. On the other side of the earth, 80 years ago, like my daughter today, my mother was on the brink of being born. Born into a world that had not come as far or as fast as she needed it to. Back then, back there, women did not delay marriage or children or attend school, let alone high school and college. But my mom is, let's say, a little defiant. She went to school in villages in Sri Lanka and then to college in India and became a math teacher at a period when math and women were never in the same sentence. She was educated and beautiful, but turned down marriage proposals into her late 30s when my father, the physics teacher down the street, came along. She had me when she was 42 and got her PhD when she was 62. She and my father brought our family to Maryland when I was a newborn and my brother was three, with no jobs and only $200 in their pockets because the circumstances of staying in Sri Lanka were unimaginable. By the time my parents fled, thousands had been killed. Children were forced to become soldiers as the country descended into civil war. My daughter's life will be easier because my parents' lives were hard. And to me, that is the American dream. Truth is, defiant and ambitious, my mom is an anachronism. And she imagined for herself and her family a world ahead of its time. And that has made all the difference. She, have, she would have fit in perfectly today as a student at Hood College and I am honored to have her here today to help celebrate all of you. Let me end by asking you to imagine with me, as my mom once did, a world ahead of its time. America's first 45 presidents were men. Imagine a world where not just the next four or five, but the next 45 presidents are women. 900 of the 950 Nobel Prizes awarded so far have gone to men. Imagine if 950 of the next thousand are won by women. Or imagine a world where women represent not 5%, not 55%, but 95% of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. What is remarkable is that for many of us, what I just described is harder to conceive of than curing cancer or a colony on Mars. But maybe that goal shouldn't strike us as audacious or outlandish, outlandish in the first place. After all, it is literally the mirror of our history, just with the shoe on the other foot. Like shooting an arrow, perhaps we have to aim higher than our mark aware of the gravitational drag of discrimination, prejudice, and patriarchy. Graduates, everyone knows that James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, 
George Washington, were contemporaries who lived in the same era and shaped our nation. Now just imagine if Harriet Tubman, Susan B. Anthony, Mary Curie, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Oprah all lived in the same day and age. The truth is, they do. They always have. They are born across the country and around the globe every day. We just have never had a world that has allowed all of them to become the women they were meant to be. Imagine what we could accomplish if we got even close to our mark, if the left and right feet of humanity waltzed in tandem, danced in true harmony for the first time since the dawn of civilization. Together, we could defeat the world's deadliest diseases and conquer its greatest perils. From apathy, to poverty, to segregation, to prejudice, to terror, to hate. Help us rebuild a world that fully unlocks the elixir of human ingenuity to overcome humanity's greatest injustices, from economic inequity to the edu educational divide. Graduates, May you be the heroines and heroes of your lives. May you never be deterred by the fear of falling down or the height of your shadow. May your children inherit schools where they learn the periodic table and the constellations above like we learned the alphabet, where a young girl is ashamed neither of her mind nor of her body, where learning about Schrodinger's cat is as much a part of growing up as the cat in the hat where our children are judged not by the color of their skin or by their chromosomes, but by the content of their character and their intellect. A change is coming, a changing of the guard, with a chance to change the stars. And whether we seize or squander that chance, whether our leaders at last look like America, or whether we reverse course, is up to all of you. Our responsibility to care for this world is also now yours. So help us achieve the tomorrow we have imagined today. Class of 2017, congratulations. Thank you, Krish. That was that was awesome. <laughs>